In modern air combat, a pilot can expect to face an enemy beyond visual range. To survive in that environment, you need to know some fundamentals about BVR. We went over those fundamentals in the previous video. Now it's time to add some building blocks to that foundation and learn how to fight back against a BVR opponent. So what goes into an offensive BVR plan? Keep watching to learn that answer. In the BVR intro video, we introduced three of the range envelopes of a BVR engagement. WES, which illustrates where an adversary's weapon can effectively reach. Minimum abort range, which is the last opportunity to turn away from a fight without entering an enemy's WES. And minimum outrange, which is the last opportunity to turn away while still keeping enough range to recommit to the fight. When you know these ranges, you have a defensive plan practically spelled out for you but it's also useful for developing an offensive plan. Each of these ranges is a decision point where a flight lead can decide to proceed closer to the adversary or turn away. Going closer to an enemy will increase the risk to the interceptor, while flying away lowers that risk. So the deciding factor in any choice will be how much risk are you willing to accept. So in a scenario where a nuclear armed strike package is headed towards your nation's capital, a commander would be willing to accept the risk of lost fighters. In this case, the flight would expect to close with the enemy. But let's say we instead see a single air-to-air -air fighter in the vicinity of a defended ground asset. Now we have a target that's inside our intercept ring, but it's not much of a threat to ground targets. The commander might not be willing to lose a fighter over this, so a lower risk option would be chosen here. In a scenario where high risk is acceptable, interceptors would launch their ordnance and continue on toward the target. This allows them to better assess the results of their shots and keep their weapons pointed toward the enemy in case further shots are needed. Any plan that follows this logic will fall under the category of Launch and Decide, which is abbreviated as LND. On the other end of that spectrum, where safety of the intercepting fighters is more important than the destruction of enemy assets, we have Launch and Leave tactics. Just like the name implies, ordnance is launched and then the fighters execute an out, which we covered in the last video. Launch and leave preserves range between interceptors and the target, thereby keeping them outside of an adversary's WES. But it also points the fighter's weapons and sensors away from the target. Flying away makes confirmation of weapon effects more difficult, and it usually results in a lower probability of a kill. But this might be enough to accomplish the mission objective. If firing a missile at a hostile aircraft gets it to leave defended airspace, then that's a win even if it doesn't result in a kill. Launch and Leave tactics have their own brevity code as well. It's known as SCAPE, and here's the official definition for it. We can see that it has these modifiers as well, so I want to take a moment to explain what they mean. In the previous video, we talked about how the minimum outrange gives a fighter an opportunity to re-engage with just enough range to make a shot before minimum abort range. Going with this tactic would be abbreviated as SCAPE, without any modifiers. Now if you waited until the last possible moment before crossing into minimum abort range to launch ordnance and execute an out, that would be a short skate. If you wanted two opportunities for launch and leave shots, then you would double this range between MAR and the out range. Executing a launch and leave from this range would be a long skate. For those times when it's absolutely imperative to destroy a target at all costs, we have launch and decide tactics. The goal here is to continue towards the target after employing ordnance to either confirm the kill or follow on with another shot. The brevity code for this doctrine, appropriately enough, is Banzai. And I want to draw attention to this part of the definition, with intent to maneuver into the visual arena. This means the flight is going all the way into visual range, which is the only real way to confirm that a target has been destroyed. Remember that just because you see a target disappear from your sensors after firing at it doesn't mean that it was hit. A defensive maneuver into radar ground clutter or advanced countermeasures can achieve the same effect. That same adversary could emerge moments later and counterattack. So you always want confirmation before treating an armed adversary as neutralized. If you can't be certain, then it would be a good idea to execute an out. So far we've talked about deciding whether or not to move closer to a target but that's only one dimension of the BVR fight. Another one is how shots are taken, which we call shot doctrine. There are going to be two ways we take shots in BVR. Shoot, assess, shoot, and shoot, shoot, assess. For the most part, they are self-explanatory, but I want to make a few points here. 
With shoot assess shoot you are intentionally holding a follow on shot to find out if another shot is needed. This is a doctrine you use when ordnance is limited since it's best for conserving ammo. Shoot shoot assess means that salvos are sent out in each attack. To better understand why this might be necessary we need to understand kill probability which is abbreviated as PK. If a particular missile has a PK of 75% then there's a 1 in 4 chance that the target will survive and be in a position to counterattack. So to increase odds you would launch additional missiles. Now the PK doesn't increase linearly, it goes up in a curve like this. A second shot brings the PK up to 94%. To get all the way up to 100% we would need to fire 4 of them. For clarity I want to mention that this number covers a very wide set of launch parameters. A 50% PK doesn't mean that you will miss half of all your shots at a given range. In fact, if you take a shot that results in a hit and you replicated the parameters for that shot exactly, then you would get a hit every single time. But changing parameters like range or aspect or adding in defensive maneuvers and countermeasures from the target will have an effect. The percentage is meant to cover all those possible variables, which is why faster missiles with better sensors do better. That extra kinetic energy gives more room to maneuver and an expanded zone where an intercept is likely to happen. During the Vietnam War, AIM-7 Sparrows were achieving a PK around 10%, which gives us a shallow curve like this. We can see that even 5 of them in a salvo is not enough to produce 50-50 odds. Now let's look at the AIM-120. In testing, it produced a PK of 80%, but in actual combat, we've seen it yield a PK of about 50%. Here's how that curve looks. A second shot gives us 75%, and a third is almost 90%. Now you know why flankers carry so many missiles. So if conserving ordnance is not a concern, then shoot, shoot, assess is the shot doctrine to use. Now there's one last topic I want to go over before we talk about building a BVR plan, and that's maneuvering. The most important maneuver here is going to be the crank. Like other important BVR concepts, it has its own brevity code. Here's how that's defined. Simply put, a crank is a turn where the target is kept inside the radar illumination cone, but at or near the limits. The direction of the turn is also important. You want to put the target on the side of the turn that reduces the closure rate the most. So if you were moving in for a stern conversion like this with the target on the left, your crank would be to the right. This slows down closure rate, which is good for us because getting closer to the enemy means an increase in risk. We want to slow that as much as possible. Remember, range is safety. The crank lets us do that, but unlike an out, which would actually increase range, the crank lets us keep our sensors pointed at the target. That's why it's crucial to keep the target within the gimbal limits of the radar. This is also important if you're using ordnance that requires illumination from your onboard radar to guide to the target. But you would still want to use it even with other ordnance, and here's why. Let's say that on a direct course to the hostile aircraft you launch a missile at 20 miles. That missile finally reaches the target when the two of you are 10 miles apart. But if you cranked and cut your closure rate in half, then that final range between the two of you would only be 15 miles. That extra range is important, especially if you're using a shoot, assess, shoot doctrine. That's five more miles you can use to line up a second shot. And if your opponent's WES reaches out to 10 miles, then the crank is the difference between life and death for you. Now I have to mention one caveat here. If an enemy fighter is actively maneuvering towards you, then a crank by itself will not add much range between the two of you. To make it more meaningful, you need to add an out. This will add more distance than just a crank. Of course, this will only work with fire and forget ordnance. You can think of this distance between the two of you like a giant pole that stretches between each aircraft. You want that pole between you and the enemy fighter that's trying to kill you to be as long as possible. This pole has a name, it's called the F-Pole, and it's the distance between both aircraft at the moment of missile impact. In training, you want to work on maximizing the F-Pole as much as possible. And you do that through a combination of maneuvers like the crank and out, shot doctrine, and tactics like launch and leave. So let's look at how you would make a plan with all of this in mind. For this scenario, we'll have a two-ship DCA cap armed with four AIM-120s each. You would start with a quick brief that might look something like this. At the top, we see a single shot doctrine and an out far enough away that we can do a recommit before minimum out range. In other words, the two fighters in the flight will fire only one missile between them at an individual group. 
This is a shoot, assess, shoot, shot doctrine. Because the range is so long, the PK will be low. But the goal here is to get the enemy to abandon its mission and turn away. A kill is just a bonus. It's also using a strict shot doctrine to conserve ammo. And it also leaves an opportunity for a short skate, which is the next part of our plan. In this scenario, we would have 7 AIM-120 shots remaining between the two fighters after a skate. Since a short skate is the last opportunity for launch and leave tactics, we see the shot doctrine is a little looser here. Now it's per contact instead of per group. So if it's a group of three contacts, that means the flight needs to expend three missiles. We also see that a crank has been added in to minimize closure rate. Following a skate and a short skate, our fighters would have four shots remaining between the two of them. But keep in mind, you don't need to use every option in order. A flight lead could skip skate and go straight to short skate if that's a better choice. These are all pre-briefed options with the goal of conveying a clear plan without a lot of unnecessary radio chatter. Lastly, we have an option for going into the visual arena. This is our launch and decide plan. Now we're at a very clear shoot, shoot, assess, shot doctrine. If we're using bonsai, it means we're going into a close range fight. And I have a video series where I explain all about it, including what a bracket is. Once this plan is in place, all it takes is a short radio call from the flight lead to execute it. So if you hear your flight lead say Viper 2-1, skate, lead group, you know exactly what's coming next. One shot at the lead group, followed by an out. This is all done without any lengthy exchanges over the radio, and it really shows off the power of having a pre-briefed plan. Beyond visual range combat is a very complex topic. We've only covered part of the concept so far in this series, but one thing to remember is that the exact tactics used will vary from one platform to the next. A Vietnam era F-4 pilot would use a different plan than an F-22 pilot today, but even on the same platform it can vary wildly. In 1991, F-15Cs carried AIM-7 Sparrow missiles during Desert Storm. Just over a decade later, those same F-15Cs returned for Operation Iraqi Freedom. Only this time, they were armed with newer AIM-120 missiles and the fighter data link for better situational awareness. BVR tactics would change dramatically even though the same airframe was used in each of these conflicts. So the takeaway here is that specific BVR tactics need to be tailored for each unit. And don't forget the adversary's capabilities need to be taken into account too. What we've covered here are the basics that will work across all platforms. Now there's one thing we haven't covered yet, and that's how we get all the numbers for a WES and how you can maximize those numbers. That's the topic of the next video. I hope you'll come back for that one, and as always, thanks for watching.